I'm always equally terrified and ecstatic when I'm up here. Um, and, then I, and then one day I realized, no, that's just how I am every day, everywhere. 50% terrified, 50% ecstatic. Um, so I'm gonna read some poems. Uh, I told James about maybe a, maybe a year ago or so, I said, please don't ever ask me to come and read until I have new material. And I'll tell you, that motivated me to get some new material, some new stuff. So I've been writing, um, and I love form. I'm gonna start off with, uh, with three acrostic poems. And I, I, if I had a whiteboard, I would diagram this stuff for you, but I don't. So instead, I'm just gonna tell you that an acrostic, there's a vertical word, and it goes down the side, and then your poem kind of works off that. So, uh, and I don't even know if that's important or not, but it's important to me, so I'm gonna tell you what those words are, too. Um, oh, and I work at the jail, and I have my dream job. I love my job. I never thought I would have a job this amazing. I work with a great population. I love my people. Um, I love everything about it. And these first three poems were inspired by my by by the jail. And they're uh, so the first one. Uh, the vertical word is called real hero. <clears throat> Ray hurried home from junior high because his mother, her aunt, the two uncles, everyone really would be passed out in the living room. He wanted to be around when his sisters, five and six years old, got home from school. Barely 12, his life was getting the girls up in the morning, making breakfast, braiding hair and cleaning teeth and faces. Repeat this every day for 11 years. Eventually, the girls left home and went to college, stayed clean, and were happy. And Ray alone drank. By 24, he had three DUIs. Now 40, Ray sees them on visitation day. And they cry when they leave, saying, thank you, thank you. This next one is called Heroin. three times and he swears he's gonna stop eventually takes the parenting classes writes learns about anger and relapse the only time he draws is in jail beautiful sketches of ravens on the telephone wires above the trees and wolves standing on snow looking into the distance his wife calls on Thursdays and talks about her day <coughs> and never cries, but when the call ends, Frank weeps and longs for the needle. And this is called healing. It's called healing because the vertical word is healing. Her uncle took her out to the desert and pushed her down a cliff, poured a fifth equal parts rum and rubbing alcohol down her throat. Stripped her down and went at it. All she can remember is being hit three times with a four by four, being punched in the head, and finally losing consciousness when he entered her. The bruises were black first, then softened into green. It lives in that faraway corner of memory we don't look at much. Listen to me. She never told anyone, and as the words flew from her, his name said for the first time, the air golden with pain and revelation, I wasn't sure if she could heal, but I thought she might. And now I'm gonna read some odes. Um, I just started writing odes, and I wanna tell you that Odes, if you don't know, because I like to tell you what the forms are, ode, an ode is an expressively and enthusiastic piece in praise of someone or something. So my first one, oh, and I'm gonna read four of these, I think, and so um, you don't have to, to applaud until, until they're, they're done. Um, this is called Ode to Chocolate Chips in the Bathtub. Yes. <laughs> oh, the holy water the mess of bubbles, 
the Epsom salts lying undissolved at the bottom of the tub. The candles, scented like ripe figs, are placed so perfectly it looks accidental. Stepping in the water, so hot I can't even move, I slowly sink my body down, immersing myself into a baptism of wet fire, my back now sucking into the bath pillow. Finally, sitting in the bath, my book on the rim of the tub, my wine glass on the rim of the tub, I reach into the tiny corningware bowl, pop three chocolate chips in my mouth, dark and luscious on my tongue, and taste heaven. My second one is called Ode to My Mother Dying. First, the memory unit. Lockdown, you were memory sick. I needed a passcode to open the door. Three years flew past us and suddenly you spent all your days in bed. I spent my time next to you saying, you can go now, it's okay, go. I'm okay, I'll take care of the boy. I thought it would be like magic that I would say it and you would go, but you didn't. You stayed and stayed and all my good magic disappeared. I started begging, please go. I need you to go now. Then hospice came, those good people who help others die. At least someone thought you might go. They took away the Seroquel and the Soma the naproxen and the simvastatin. They came to help you die when I couldn't. Wait, I have to start this over. Let me start here. I was a teenager, sullen, sarcastic. You and my father called me into the kitchen. What, I said. And you said, pull the plug on us. We don't want to be, what is it? Vegetables. That's what you said. I said I would because I was a teenager who wanted to get out of the kitchen. I didn't know what you were asking. I didn't understand the depth of dying. In the memory unit, I had lost you. But then for eight weeks after hospice came, I had you back. You were beautiful. I could see you again. Without the drugs swimming in your veins, I found you. I found you by looking into your eyes. I found you in the way back, behind the pupil and the iris, back into the you who always knew me. So I waited for you to die, and while I waited, we had root beer floats every night. I fed you and gave you baths. I talked and looked into you, finding you over and over again, finding the reason I couldn't have pulled the plug had there been one. Later, I walked your body down the hallway for the last time and watched the man gently tuck you into the back of the big black car and drive away. I was empty, but as I moved across the parking lot and the sun smattered itself across the sky and some bird sang somewhere, I celebrated your leaving. <laughs> Thank you. You know, there's a whiskey in that lecture, and if you need it, like. Thank you very much. I will wait for it. You man. <laughs> you knew I was going to need one. I did not know. Thank you. I didn't know if I was going to be able to get through that one. Thanks. This is called Ode to the Graffiti Tiles at Two Guns. Oh, and if you don't know, Two Guns um, is about 30 miles east, and it's this beautiful old ruin. And, uh, it, there, and there's just graffiti everywhere. It's an old KOA camp. So this is Ode to the Graffiti Tiles at Two Guns. You are sprinkled over the floor of the old KOA like diamonds. Four by four glossy square diamonds, purple and teal, orange and hideous pink. 
If I put you back together, you would be a mural saying, the only answer is love, or your friends brought you here to kill you. You are mostly the past and slightly the present, but your future is crushed and ground into the dry dirt. You are not alive, but I want to know what you've seen. You are just fired clay blasted with spray paint lying beneath the voices of ghosts and the wind. You remind me of the loose girl in high school, so young and smooth in the beginning, sheltered from the rain, then covered with paint around the eyes and lipstick for no one to kiss. I stoop to collect you, two, then six, then twelve tiles to take home. Relics of the past, beautiful bits of words and crude pictures, puzzles I'll construct on the back fence or the garden box, and I'll listen hard in the dark of night to hear your stories. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> um, and then this one is called Ode to a First Kiss. Ode to a First Kiss, which is such a trite thing to write and the question of how to make it just a little new or different than any other kiss seems almost comical. But the truth of it is this. We were already, I'm sorry. I just skipped like four lines. I'm gonna start this one over again. Ode to, the, to a first kiss, which is such a trite thing to write. And the question of how to make it just a little new or different than any other kiss seems almost comical. But the truth of it is this. I celebrate that I asked for the kiss, and when I asked, we were already bare, and our bodies already touching full length from our toes to our chests. And the ode, which may start right here, is that once asked, your lips touched mine, and basically birds sang, and the sun came out at midnight, and the heavens opened, and there might have been angels or fairies, and all that shit I thought trite became new and crazy fine. And that's the fucking ode, is I celebrate you making the world new simply through kissing me. <laughs> oh, those are my odes. Yeah. I love odes. I've written 10 in the last week and a half, and I'm going to write 200. So, yeah, so next time you come to a reading with me, plan on staying a while. <laughs> um, and then, do I have time for one more? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read one more. Um, 200 more. Okay. <laughs> so, when I told James that, uh, that I shouldn't come back until I'd written new stuff, I decided that I, didn't, that I wasn't ever going to read anything from this book because it was old stuff. But then it was weird. Once I actually wrote new stuff, I was like, oh, I kind of like that old stuff too. So I'm going to read a poem called Current. Um, and uh, I jump in. The water covers me. I am being born. The water is air. I start to swim. I start to cry. I keep swimming. Some things die, but mostly things grow. Marigolds at the side of the house, puppies from the hunting dog that lives in the backyard. When I hurt, my mother says I have growing pains. I'm not popular, but I'm not the outcast. I'm not smart, but I'm not the idiot. I'm not even swimming, really. I'm doing the dog paddle. I stay afloat. In the sixth grade, I have knobby knees and long hair. I'm embarrassed most of the time in a general way. I sit outside at night and watch Venus rise. I go to Dairy Queen with my mom and dad. I keep swimming. Things are still dying or growing. I go to movies, I try a sip of bourbon, I get my high school pictures back. I shake the water out of my eyes. People swim alongside me sometimes, but mostly they don't. The water flows so fast. I choke on air. I love moving. Sometimes I'm so tired I don't move at all. Some days I go back. Some days I go forward, but I keep swimming. I write letters. I like the taste of stamps. I miss my mom and dad, but I live far away and don't call. I'm in a big place. I worry about freeway shootings. I swim away. 
I live where things are covered in fog. I can't tell the difference between the growing and the dying. I play pool or shop for postcards. I may still be having growing pains. I may be drowning. I may just be plain and average. I move to a small place. I never drink champagne. I date sad men. I like addicts. I read books. I practice blowing out birthday candles. One day, I grow legs. I walk on land. I'm still not popular, but I'm still not the outcast. Once in a while, I have sex appeal. I watch my parents get old. I talk to them every day. I become patient. I understand the importance of photographs. I grow vegetables in the backyard. I keep walking. Sometimes, I close my eyes when I eat. I chuckle when I'm by myself. I find people to walk with. I dance in the living room. I have a child. He is swimming. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Her next reader, um, my friend Vernon Begay. Um, and uh, I met Vernon, I think I met Vernon through the Miracle of Facebook. I think he is one of my, my stepdad. Bill Wetzel's friends. Bill's, um, Bill's, uh, Bill's the most famous um, living Blackfoot um, MMA and uh, fighter and, and, and bull rider um, living today who now teaches, teaches English in Shanghai, which makes him, I believe, the, the tallest Blackfoot teaching English in Shanghai. <laughs> Um, because because there aren't any others. Uh, <laughs> it's a good thing he's a long way away that I'm talking shit about him. Um, but but Vernon, I, you know, I, I first saw Vernon's work um, just his Facebook posts, um, and they they gave me a, a a whole you know they they sort of embodied this 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 part of the world that we live in in a way that his his words sort of sort of encompass some things that, that, that I, I and some feelings that, about this about this part of the world that I, I really hadn't I'd never seen anybody kind of tie up like that. I've never seen anybody express like that. Um, and uh, you know he and he gave me some language that uh, that I didn't that I didn't have but I needed um, which is which is a pretty cool thing. Uh, Vernon Begay everybody. Uh, my name is Vernon Begay and uh, my plans are bit be between and uh, not quite in that, so uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be reading a short story. Uh, it's called The Penny Thief. The Penny Thief is a character when I was going to school at IA, and I never really gave him a face until uh, <clears throat> and Jesse uh, asked me to read. And uh, this came about like uh, trying to write for 20 minutes, I guess. <clears throat> Here we go. I didn't know how long the, running, the penny thief stood in the back of the class. We were in Rojo's ESL class, English as a Second Language. She wore a red dress with her red high heels and red lipstick. Even her hair was red. Tits, the penny thief shouted. All the seats shuffled and all the black heads spun on their swivel. Twat, he said. Rojo swiftly made it to the little boy. The next word he attempted began, clit. Clit tore, but then Rojo covered his mouth, and she wrapped her arms around the little frame. I grew a grin in the process. I all, all of us did. We didn't know what the word meant. We had all been uprooted from, from Riz, somewhere deep in the Riz, past uh, post uh, bust here, heard it, into this, heard it into this class with white square tiles. Our deep copper skin, thanks to the sun and wind, was an easy telltale sign of our English extended only to pop and candy. So when the penny thief said tits and twat, only food came to my mind. The breakfast here was great. It was different every day, but the same every week for a month. Tits sounded good, something a guy, guy would might eat and not want to let go. God, probably good right now, like ice cream. That's, that little third grader made us all proud. Apparently, Rojo was living very proud too, to experience an emerging success blooming right before, before us in this English world. I wanted them words too, smeared on my mouth. <clears throat> the penny thief was expelled. That month I could not, I would run to this bus stop all alone and I didn't see him, even on the weekends. One Sunday evening when I played a little 
too long, I saw Grandma at the corral. It made me feel, my, it made my feet quick, quickly quicken, falling right in rhythm with the, the beating in my chest. I crashed up the first hill, and I was like this onto the next hill, several hills. Thank the university was a sun moon. I regrouped group by then. I rained my breath, breath down and listened. Every everyone around here. Wait, come on. <clears throat> Everyone around here was in the sheep business, but bad mishap like this were under a department that belonged to one guy, that marble-eyed coyote. He probably heard this bell already, and my heartbeat, and I, my stumbled affair, I would hunker down. I would hunker down at the first sign of bells. I thought my ears were wrong so bad that the wind had picked up, picked up, mocked me by a bell that I heard from here and there. Everything sounded like a bell. As I continued, in earshot, I heard footsteps and a glimpse of a shadow lurking at the corner of my eye. Once I waited, at the corner of my eye. Once I waited in a truck where the buried, the buried man, as a, as kids do, I pressed questions on all ears. Only the old tracker mocked my mind in death. What was and what wasn't? To which I always added, What if they woke up? They still, and they're still alive. Death didn't make sense. But being afraid out, out of the, but being afraid out here in the dark, had some sort of connection. He spoke of a boy that was born with a bad eye, bad feet, bad everything, and the man that knew how to knew too much, how they rolled them up and left. This wooded area sparked my imagination on, of unmarked burials, maybe waiting to attain itself to the simple-minded or attach itself to the simple-minded. He said, from a bush, my mind could not grasp the uneven depth under this fading sky, and the moon was not strong enough to go by. The ground met me with a punch. I lost my breath and rolled to my back. My eyebrows quivered above my gnarly, gnarled eye. The penny thief fell back against the hill and laughed, swatting the rolled magazine to his other hand. He always had his nose deep in that magazine. He discovered his uncle's magazine that year. We, we, Uncle's Magazine and the 22, the Penny Thief and I stood between the sheep and the ever elusive coyote. We cussed his name in as many possible ways. We had never seen him, but from the old tracker's quote stories, he had one white eye. We named it Juniper Berry Eyes. We carved sand cloths and made Juniper Berries in its eyes and we tried to shoot its eye out. I caught my breath. He said again, I could not find an English word that rhymed with I squinted into the wind. I had nothing. I raised up and ran again. In, in one swift move, he was on my tail. I held that pace until our breath were delivered and feet hit the ground in unison. But there was no winner or loser. The bell, the bell snapped us out, snapped out our momentum. We dove into the snow, our belly against the snow. The water never melted that month. We waited for the old goat to rattle his neck. In his in this listening, we had our heads in our jackets. My breath was warm and slowly exhaled. It was so quiet. Now, <clears throat> a different bell stood swift into the infinity of our ears. Then he set up. He reached into his pocket and marked the one slight breeze. He held a book to it. It seemed like it was looking at every page. It turned two pages this way and it grabbed at it. The page delighted open and the penny thief laughed. The tips flat everywhere. Legs sprawled like a kick from that web magazine. Finally, the penny thief pinning his thumb to the random page. He then looked square into my eyes and puckered his lips, spat his skull, it rolled in its, and and the snow dust formed a blanket over it. His nose flared long and slow, but I knew he was surprised how I, how I, how I, I outran him. I could see, oops, I, I could see the, the bomb that ignited in his chest that that was on repeat. <clears throat> we continued this way, split it up, covered up some ground, our back together. Each time we would let loose longer, 
Each time he let the book loose longer, spat. This time the bell rang close. He killed a den that had extended into itself into our world. With that I took off. His foot scratched the snow for, it, for pivot. The moonlight leaden had took over. Only one place this far north the sheep could be. The thought of it made me avoid the red rock street with juniper. <clears throat> the penny thief was gone. Somewhere a horse held its weight evenly and longer, flipped its worse to keep balance against a downhill. The old tracker was on the on to the loose sheep too. I made my way to where old whiskey laid. The pups met me. The weather wood had had into one a tight weed, formed a nice corral. It was withstood as a mighty hogan, I think, at one time. <clears throat> I didn't see him for a while after that. I still ran to the bus stop. I would start a few seconds later each week. I still made the school. That's the school. One day, the old tracker said he was at the trading post with him, the great-grandfather, the penny thief. Looked great. His great-grandfather and him were having a blast talking about talking Navajo. The old tracker talked with them. A few days later, there was a flap at the door. The old Pendleton moved at the hip. The old tracker yelled, "Wash day!" The penny, the penny thief, took kick in some, kick some fog, kick in some fog. I quickly jumped up, and he didn't look at me. He was polite in in a manner. Grandma cussed at the weary lamp light, the that lit the white walls. The old tracker kicked it off. I knew this already. It was on. A coyote was near. I jumped out of my clothes and I leaped into the cold air. He couldn't see me. I could see more than a stone's throw away. I left him. There, the juniper, there, the juniper crackled, cackled. I see from his hair melted. I, the ice from his hair melted and beaded down his face. I picked up Grandma's old sheep trail, his old dog's sheep trail. In no time, I heard heavy breathing in the whiteness. The brush were frozen fuzz. The whole, the whole world had frost over, and now us, the moon. And the moon sun formed a perfect art, uh, circle. We continued through the cliffs, bluffs, and splitter, and splitter of sprung, splitter of frozen, frozen water sprung from our tracks. We could hear the slow rasp of the wind. It sharpened the grass to a blade. It made the arrows out of air. We breathed this in. The penny thief <clears throat> shedded his coat. We pressed on, stride for stride. We were made for this. Our, our muscles one tight sinew on the old on the old tracker's bow, like the old tracker's bow. We completed we completed we competed where we <laughs> we com we had completely forgot about the coyote. We blazed all out. Our lungs were getting slashed, the foam blood was filling our body, our feet began to disturb our teeth gnashed, also frozen white, our muscles on repeat. We slowly lifted away from our bodies. I couldn't, I could see myself running. The both of us, it began that way. Orbs of light began to float. It fell from the sky, laying a sun frost over the landlord, or over the land, made a final squeeze. Our ears drums burst, the, the silence, the silence, the air blades, the aeroplane feigned our world into a knot. We had found a place where, the place the old tracker talked about, the place where the rain, rain clouds let their children play. We heard human laughter there in the tall grass, shambles of it boiled. I rolled ahead and a black dot soon floated out. <clears throat> the ball of grass, they would collide and separate into more balls under the grass. That they all ran back to the top. But they all ran back to the top. From the ball of the, the ball of grass, noses appeared. Then a tongue leaped to the dot. The dot became a nose. Then it bloomed into a beautiful coyote. I ever a beautiful coyote I ever seen. Her pelt was like. Her pelt was like looking at an endless mountain range, rendered in the depth from the light to the dark as only nature could. The pups exposed her mom. Then she opened her eyes. It was a blue moon. Our eyes dropped. Juniper Gray was a girl. <clears throat> I was drawn to the 
I was drawn to her eye. It turned into a slip, then it turned to like a shadow, formed a profile, a man. It was a doorway to somewhere. The face was forming when I saw the penny thief had beat time itself and as he was moved forward, as he moved forward with his gun, aiming high at the coyote. He had pulled the trigger already before the eyes opened. I closed my eyes and I felt a blast. Gravity pounded into air, back into my air, my lungs. The knot unraveled. We grasped for air. That was what I told the penny thief. <clears throat> Opposite the bepizid, he said. With that, he got up, took several steps, and his sheep heard a strut, and he stepped over a hill and hit, and, ne and the next, on, on to the next one in no time. He became a part of the line in the horizon. I said, it's not bullshit. <clears throat> I probably went back to the, I probably went back to grandma's, probably climbed onto the chair, probably flopped my ex ex elbows onto the table and buried my chin on, on it. She probably gave me some blue corn mush. She probably said, there's magic in there. The penny thief went absent, absent again. Sometimes people came into friendly and that would drop by. They would hug and laugh and tease and stagger and fell asleep in the sun. <clears throat> and when and when one did, I'd walk out. I guess I didn't want to walk out. I guess I didn't want to see him in that truck, in the back of the truck. One day I heard sheep when we raced we raced top. <clears throat> one day I heard the sheep when we were raced, I was surprised to see him with their flock there. I walked up to him. His hair was combed by the shirt collar over the bite. It looked like a overbite of hair. He had bruises. I sat down and we sat in silence. He then said, It is hard to rhyme. But do you make it? It sounds like, Did I do that? We laughed for a long time. He then, he then said, I should be in school. He, says, he said the land in, was, in him, was in him already. He wanted a chance at life, to be someplace far away. He didn't want never to hear sheep again. He was tired of this land, alone solitude. I myself didn't think that way. All that was red had put his fangs into him. To shoot Juniper eyes would be like shooting himself, he said. I was inevitable. It was inevitable. She will meet her demise, both of them, all of us. We sat in silence under the noonday sun. It was bright, blinding. He was. He said, "One more bullet left. I got one more bullet left." He said, "And you should leave now." <clears throat> when I was young, I saw my dad shoot his gun into the night. I was drawn to the fairy ribbon that came out of it. I always wanted to touch it, and the penny thief never shot at night for the sole reason. A couple of days later, I heard the bullet. It had been the sound, it had been the one that imploded into him. I was in Rojo's class. The policeman came to the door along with the principal. Rojo asked us to sing the song, sing the song. The class stirred to a song, are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? My, our, my eyes followed in her shoulders drop and left. I could hear her high heels into the hall. I followed. I turned the corner to where Rojo all and all of them went. And I just finished the rest of, our, the, rest of the song in our own thing, <clears throat> in our way, in our, in our way. I sing, Brother John, Brother Son, are you sleeping? Monkey yes is eeny, monkey yes is eeny, ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong. <clears throat> and I went to the door to where they were talking. Then it was Rojo. She was then, she was there. Her words fell apart. I stood against the wall. Rojo began to cry. My, my legs gave and slid to the ground a long, a long pause. Then, then a long pause. Then said one, then Rojo said one more thing. Out of nowhere, out of nowhere, nowhere I heard opposite the opposite. She had seen her head of knees. Nesda instead 
I jumped up and crashed through the door. Rojo was smiling. The petty thief was reciting this week's vocabulary word in his own language. What else can I do but say opposite the opposite? We both got into our regular class, but we got we both got got into our regular classes, but we decided to spend an hour each day with Mrs. Rojo. Later, much later, he told me on that day when we broke the sound barrier, he had pulled a trigger, but the juniper eyes had before juniper eyes opened her eye. It surprised him, but what really threw him off was how at that split second, my finger reached to the tip of the gun and the gun buckled and choked its own words. I had nothing to say to that, that story, but opposite the opposite. <laughs> we never ran no more, but our sentences did. Our run, at least our run on sentences had rhymed at last.